Okay, so here we are coming into uh, Wilderness Trail Distillery in Danville, Kentucky. So you can see a little bit here. So there's just the old distillery house, or the old house, I should say. And we've got obviously the distillery here. So my dad and I will be taking a uh, little tour here shortly. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, get a little bit of footage, but really, really cool ground. So yeah, you can see some of the uh, rick houses out in the back. Um, pan this way a little bit. So yeah, all the nice big black uh, rick houses. So cool little uh, old farmhouse from back in the day. And then you got the modern distillery here. Rick houses as far as the eye can see. So there you've got this a little bit. So uh, stay tuned and we'll get you a uh, little more footage here pretty soon. So stay tuned. So here we are at the Wilderness Trail. This is a little bit of their uh, inside of their kind of their gift shop area. We'll be taking a tour pretty soon, so I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and do a little recording there shortly as well. So you can see a few of the fermentation tanks back there, but just a quick little video of the uh, inside of the of their um, gift shop area. So very, very cool. Stay tuned. You'll, uh, you'll get a little more information here pretty soon. So actually, let me do a quick little uh, video of some of the bottles that they've got over here so you can see. We are a fairly new distillery here in Kentucky. We got started in 2012 in downtown Danville. When we got started, we started in a pretty small industrial warehouse, pretty much the size of this. Only a handful of guys, only making around one or two barrels a day. Um, as you can see, we've come quite far away since then. Uh, but eventually they added a few more guys on shift, bumped that up to two barrels a day. And then in 2016, we moved out to this campus out here. When we first moved out here, we were on 43 acres of land. When we first moved out here, we bumped that barrel production up from two barrels a day to 12 barrels a day pretty nice for us. Um, everything we'll taste today and everything you see on the shelves today was made when we were downtown um, off of our pot still. We'll start bottling some of our column still bourbon a little later this year so feel free to come back and get some of those bottles as well. Uh, but in 2017 we added another shift and started producing 24 hours a day and bumped that production up from 12, bar 12 barrels a day to 24 barrels a day. Um, and so then in 2018 we had our most recent expansion and our largest expansion was a 10 million dollar expansion. We built this visitor center and the larger side of the distillery behind me. So now we're making over 200 barrels a day. So in eight years, pretty large, a pretty rapid expansion. I um, went from that one barrel a day to now we're the 13th or 14th largest bourbon distillery in the world. Um, we kind of owe a lot of that thanks to Firm Solutions, our parent company, which just allowed us to expand infrastructure-wise pretty much before we even sold our first bottle of bourbon. Um, unfortunately, we can't go over and check out our lab for Firm Solutions today just because it's too tight of an area to fit everyone over there. But a little background about that company, it was started in 2006 by Dr. Patrick Heiss, who you saw in here earlier, and Shane Baker. So they first met in the mid-90s when they were attending UK together, and they played in a little rock band. Pat was the front man, and Shane played guitar, is how they first met. Eventually they went on to do their own things. Pat uh, has a background, or Pat has a PhD in plant pathology and a background in microbiology, and it's pretty much our chief scientific officer here on site. Um, Shane has a background in mechanical engineering and distilling. He kind of oversees a lot of the stuff going on with the distillery. So they started Firm Solutions in 2006, primarily working with the fuel ethanol industry. So just as you have alcohol in all of your distilled spirits, and most of your fuel, you have a little bit of alcohol as well. So they kind of helped them with the whole fermentation and distillation process. And they eventually started working with a lot of distilleries and breweries as well. Uh, so typically, if someone does have a problem in fermentation or any production, they're going to send us samples so we can kind of run a lot of tests on them and see what's going on. Um, say they have an off coloring or off flavoring, the alcohol percentage isn't really where they want it to be, or they're just not hitting that nail. They're going to send us those samples and we're going to run some high performance like chromatography testing, some different gram staining, just a whole bunch of different bacterial analysis to see what is causing that problem. After that, we'll send it back and kind of coach them through the whole process of fixing everything. So we can do this for a lot of other distilleries, but we also do it here, obviously. So people are gonna overnight us samples, and we'll get it back to them in 24 to 48 hours, but everything we do here on site, we can get our results back in 20 to 30 minutes. So that kind of helps with a lot of our process around here. 
Um, but we like to claim that we're the sweet mash and the science guys of the industry. So we take a lot of pride in that. Um, a little bit about our product. So the first bourbon we released was our Yellow Label bourbon in April of 2018. Um, so this is a bottled and bond bourbon, and it's our weeded bourbon as well. So we like to be pretty transparent, not all the mash bills on the side, 64% corn, 24% wheat, and 12% malted barley. We all familiar with bottled and bond, heard that terminology before, so just four requirements, that one bonded facility, aged in a bonded warehouse, uh, bottled at 100 proof, and aged for at least four years. So back in the day, that just ensured you were getting your quality product. Nowadays, there's a lot of regulations. You don't really have to worry about people tampering with your bourbon or anything like that, but if you meet those four requirements, you get that stamp of bottled and bond. So in April of 2019, we came out with our small batch bourbon. This is also our high rye bourbon. So what we did is we took out that 24% wheat in our yellow label, we added 24% rye in our black label. The yellow label is also a single barrel, and this one is a small batch. There's no definite number on small batch, it just means that you blended a few barrels together. So typically, it can be anywhere from five to maybe even 100. Ours is 12 to 15. We just like that larger quantity with a more consistent flavor profile. So that's kind of why we decided to come out with the small batch. In between the two, we came out with our cast strength rye whiskey, so I'm sure all you all know. All bourbon is whiskey, not all whiskey is bourbon. So in order to be bourbon, that main ingredient needs to be corn. Um, and this one, the mash bill is 56% rye, 33% corn, and 11% malted barley. The one thing that differs from the other ones as well is that this is cast strength. The other two are required by law to be 100 proof. This one, whatever it comes out of the barrel is what we'll bottle it at. We're not gonna proof it down or anything like that. So this particular bottle and barrel is 117 proof. I have some 116, some 113, 106. They're kind of all over the place. Um, four or five years ago, we were going into the barrel around 110 proofs. So that's why most of these are high. Nowadays, we go into the barrel around 100 proof on our rye whiskey. So in four or five years time, most of them are probably gonna sit around that 105, 106 mark. So I always say, get the good stuff while you can. Um, these are all of our bourbons, other than our six year product, which I'm sure most of you all are aware of. Um, the oldest product that we have to date. And that is the same mash bill as our yellow label bourbon. So that's 64% corn and 24% wheat, 12% malted barley. In that six year bottle, we kind of start to stray away from the cereal grains to start to get a little more of that barrel taste and finish to it. Um, a lot of distilleries and people involved in the bourbon industry say that six to 10 or 12 year mark is really that sweet spot where you get a lot of that barrel profile. Uh, but some of our other spirits that came out before we released any of our bourbon was Harvest Rum. So this is Kentucky's only rum. It's made from sorghum molasses grown in Mount Sterling, about an hour or so away from here. Typically rum is made from sugar cane. It's not a crop that grows too well here in Kentucky. So when the settlers were moving out west, they discovered sorghum. Similar to sugar cane, stalk-like, almost looks like corn without any fruit on it. Um, so we have a farmer that'll mill it all down and then we'll distill it and age it in a reused bourbon barrel for up to two years. That's what's gonna give it a lot of its color and most of its taste. It actually tastes a little like a light whiskey rather than a typical spice rum like Captain Morgan or Bacardi or anything like that. And before we release that, we came out with our Blue Heron Vodka. So what's kind of unique about this is it's made from the same mash bill as our yellow label bourbon. So instead of going into the barrel, we're just going to redistill it up to 190 proof before we add some water to it, bring it back down to 80 proof and bottle it. You can make vodka out of anything with the sugar content as long as you distill it up to that 190 proof. Um, so typically it's potatoes because they just have a high amount of starches in them, but ours is a multi-grain vodka. Another unique characteristic about it is that it's an unfiltered vodka. It's one of five unfiltered vodkas on the market. Traditionally, most distilleries are gonna charcoal filter them. And that takes out a lot of those odors and flavors in there and kind of just gives you your good alcohol burn and it mixes well with a lot of other stuff. This actually tastes pretty good meat because we don't charcoal filter it, so we leave a lot of those natural flavors in there as well. Um, if you look out this window over here, you can see a lot of our expansion going on pretty much. So that old house right there was built in 1857. It's the original house on the property. Prior to this building being built, that's where the visitor center was ran out of. So nowadays, it would pretty much be impossible to kind of have a lot of people going through this. In 2018, they built this one. Nowadays, it's just primarily offices. Um, these two warehouses over here to the left were built in 2017. The one closest to the road is gonna hold around 12,000, and the one we'll visit is gonna hold around 22,000. Uh, the original one that's hidden right behind this house holds around 2,500. Now one a little further back, around four or five months ago, nothing there. It was just completely flat ground. And I, actually about a month ago is when they put that black case in over the top. So in a few weeks we should be good to go so we can start running some barrels in there as well. Um, so things are always moving around here, we're always expanding. 
Um, we're currently in around 23 different states. In a few years, we hope to be in all 50. Pretty much. So business is booming around here. Are there any questions about our products, or are we ready to get head into fermentation? Perfect. So just our grains. We get our corn and our wheat from Cavendale Farms, which is located around a mile and a half from us. It's actually located on the other side of that hill over there. We just purchased around 150 acres across the street, and they bought around 300 acres right next to us. They're literally about to start growing right in our backyard, which is pretty advantageous for us. Um, one thing that kind of separates us from a lot of other distilleries here in Kentucky is that we get our rye from here in Kentucky. We get it from Adairville, which is about an hour or so away. Not too sure which direction it is from us, but I know it's an hour away. Uh, most distilleries get their rye from the upper Midwest, so the Northeast, or even UK or Germany. So it's pretty nice to have that locally grown rye. It's in the Heritage Heirloom Rye strand that they grow for us. It just works well in our mash bill. The only thing we don't get from here in Kentucky is our barley. We get that up from Wisconsin. They airlift it over from Canada and then they drive it down from there. Barley is also just a crop that doesn't grow pretty well here in Kentucky and there's not a large enough malting facility to kind of keep up with the demand of the industry. So we get that from up in Wisconsin. But after it comes in, we're going to hammer mill all those grains and almost to a fine powder and then we'll come into the cooker. So we do a fusion mash style of cooking, similar to how you're going to cook all your meats and your vegetables. Everything's going to cook at different temperatures. So first we're going with that corn around 190 degrees and let it cook for around 45 minutes. Second, we'll go in with that flavoring grain. So that's either going to be our wheat or our rye, depending on which bourbon or whiskey we're making. On this side today, all these fermentation tanks are filled with our high rye bourbon. So that's 64% corn and 24% rye. Um, after that, we'll add that barley in around 145 degrees. And our barley has a high amount of enzymes in it. So what's that, what, what is that going to do? It's going to break down a lot of those starches in our corn, our wheat, and our rye create a lot of simple glucose molecules, so eventually when we go into the fermentation tanks, all the yeast cells are going to have a little easier time breaking it down and creating some alcohol. So each one of these cookers is going to take around three to four hours to fully cook, cook and then cool down. So after around seven to eight hours, we can fill up one of these fermentation tanks. So it's going to take around 100,000 uh, pounds of grains to fill up one of these fermentation tanks. Um, we'll come over here and check out one that's a little more active. Once you go into the fermentation tank, we're going to add around 40 pounds of yeast. So in there, the yeast is going to further break down those glucose molecules and create one part alcohol and one part CO2. That's a lot of that bubbling that you see going on the top, going on at the top. Uh, we're not boiling it or anything. All of these tanks are regulated. They're around 85 to 90 degrees, just depending on the type of mash bill that we're working with. But that CO2 that's sitting on top creates pretty much a natural barrier to any bacteria that may get in there. That's why we're able to have these open fermentation tanks. You can actually feel some of the heat coming off of it. You start up here and then go down a little lower and you'll feel it coming off. So we call this distiller's beer. It's going to stay in here for around three to five days just depending on the fermentation cycle. Um, and it's going to reach around 8 to 12 percent. So after that third or fourth day, you're going to have a lot of the grains collecting at the bottom and a large layer of alcohol sitting right at the top. So that's when we transfer it over to our beer well, which just pretty much acts as a big mixing unit before we go into our column still. Um, but feel free to kind of walk around and see the different levels that we, at which each fermentation tank is at. They're all probably around 12 to 18 hours away from each other. Hoses hanging over the top are going to capture some of that CO2 and expel it out to the atmosphere. Because if not, it would be even tougher to breathe in here.
ready to go into our distillery. We can have when we started distilling downtown, that was the pod still that we were operating okay. off of over there. And after that, they have to completely clean it out and start again. So if I had enough guys to work that day, or if someone wanted to put in some extra chips, maybe we were getting two barrels, but pretty much for that first 365 days, we're sitting at that single barrel. Uh, so 2016, they installed our still on the left. It's an 18-inch column with a 250-gallon doubler. And then 2018, they installed our still on the right. It's a 36-inch column with a 500-gallon doubler. Uh, this is Cooper, our distillery cat. I guess he's wandering the premises today. Kind of runs the show around here. So these two operate just the same way. The one on the left corresponds to this side of the distillery. The one on the right corresponds to the larger side of the distillery. Uh, there's more windows on the left. So you can kind of see what's going on, but as you can see, some of that mash gets collected in those windows. It's a pain to clean out. Um, and then eventually over time too, if that column starts heating up a little too much, it's gonna burn that mash in there and kind of give our bourbon an operating space. We have to just stay on top of it and make sure we're cleaning it out. And then when they install the one on the right, they said we can't have that many windows. It would be a pain to try to clean it all out. But the way they operate is so from the beer well, they'll go through that silver tube and pump into around that fourth window you see up there. On this side, we're pumping in at around 10 gallons per minute, and on the right side, it's between 40 and 50 gallons per minute. So what happens is in between each one of these windows is a stripping plate, kind of like a copper bowl with a cap on top and some holes in it, similar to a colander or a strainer. There's one of those stripping plates in between each one of those windows from the bottom all the way to the top. It's going to act as a two-way street within the column. All that liquid and solid matter is going to fall to the bottom where we siphon it off, and then we're steam heating all of that stuff as well. So it's around 220 degrees at the bottom and around 198 degrees at the top. So we're heating up all that water and alcohol and all the good alcohol will start rising to the top. You have 10 to 12 different kinds of alcohol, most are in your cleaning solutions, fingernail polish removers, all that bad smelling and tasting stuff. And a lot of them have boiling temperatures below water. So they're continuously being burned off all the way throughout the column. The majority of the distillation in the column is going to occur in those top four chambers you see up there. That's why it's so clear. Um, up there we call it our low one. It's going to reach around 110 proof. From there we'll condense those alcohol vapors back down into a liquid, come down into the doubler for the last phase of distillation. So in there we're going to heat it up again, not above water's boiling point, but just enough to heat up some more of that alcohol. So we'll go from 110 proof to the top of the column, and then once we come in here we're going to reach around 140 proof. So you can't distill bourbon any higher than 160 proof, you can't go into the barrel any higher than 125. So after we come from here, we're going to mix it with a little bit of water and proof it down to around 110 proof on our bourbon and 100 proof on our rye whiskey. We like that low barrel proof entry point because more often than not, we do sell a 100 proof product. And if we go in at a 120 proof, typically after four years or so, we're going to have to proof it down quite a bit and it's going to take away from that flavor that we're really going for. So that is why we like that low barrel proof entry point. Uh, so our rye whiskey is right down to 100, okay. um, but our rye bourbon still stays at around 110. Okay. Is there any questions on our still or anything at the moment? Uh, and then this little guy over here is Walker Whitford. It's the world's only whiskey powered spirit set. Um, I think they're fixing some things with him, so he's not fully operational right now. Um, but he has around 332 little moving parts. Typically, if we turn them on, whiskey would start flowing through here and start going through these wheels, and he'd start pushing his barrel on top. He's named after Walker Daniel, who helped discover Gamble. Um, it's just a gift from Vendome Copper when they installed our still. So, the world's only whiskey power spirit set. Neat little thing to have. So prior to the 1970s, we were taxing the alcohol free and how much it produces. We just had to have that receptacle available for someone to come and test it. Nowadays, they just stick around and kind of preserve that heritage and all the history within the bourbon industry. We'll take a little peek at the inside of our barrel. We have Cooper's 11, 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 C
one of the char, each of the temperature two seconds, direct intense flames. Uh, there's a little visual of the char that occurs at Independence Day Company right over there. Um, so what you see a lot of discrepancy in most distilleries is where they toast their barrel heads. So the toast is not a direct intense flame, it's more like an oven. So we'll heat up that wood a little bit. Some will get a low toast anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes, or a high toast anywhere from 45 minutes to around 90 minutes. We get around 45 minutes done on our barrel. Um, and we like that just because it's just going to dry out a little more of the tannins and vanilla to allow that burn to be really um, So empty these barrels are going to weigh around 125 pounds each. After we fill them up with 53 gallons of liquor, they're going to weigh around 550 pounds. So it's a pretty labor intensive part of the whole process. But without the guys that throw it up and without the ones moving them in the rick house, we can't get our dirt. Um, our bungs are made out of hot bar. Once it gets wet, it's just going to swell up and create that nice pressurized seal. Nothing in these barrels are bolted together or anything. They're all just pressurized and connected by the those rings. So, this is going to take around two to two and a half minutes to fill. It's all pressure automated. So, once it reaches halfway, you have to slow the fill. It'll just automatically rise up. We'll put that bung in and let it roll out. We're going to let them sit for a few hours before we take them to the warehouse just to make sure that there are no leaks going on. Um, more often than not, if there is a leak, they're going to catch it in those first five or six hours. I'll show you some of our stains over here. Look at this. Because after that seven to eight years, you don't even really get that much of that flavor from the barrel because it's only really gone half the way in. I think it's around a level three char on the inside, too. So it's not really bending with that barrel too much. One thing that's nice about ours is that after drying that out, we remove a lot of that stuff. So it allows that alcohol to go pretty neat in there. This is only after four years. So after four years, you can see it's really picking up a lot of those barrel qualities. It's starting to get more of that oak and leather flavor. It's starting to square away from this, that cereal grain there, which you see a lot in uh, young whiskey. Uh, so this is only after four years. So I couldn't even imagine our six year bourbon barrel kind of look barrel look like now. We like to attribute our low barrel proof entry point and that air drive pretty much that allows that, that alcohol to see. Are there any questions about our barrels or any of this before we get headed out to our rick house? A level char is that? Four on the inside. It's a little heavier in some parts, um, but it's still fair. There's no questions, we can head out to our rick house. six different barrels a day, um, which is nice because eventually we're going to start bottling those 12, 12 barrels a day that we were producing in 2016. Yeah, that's a significant amount of production. Then. Yeah, a lot of things. So yeah, they'll be having, they're adding on to our shipping warehouse, so they're building one right next to it. And then our next barrel house will be going up right over there. So A is our oldest barrel house. Um, it used to be the smallest barrel house in Kentucky, holding around 2,500 until Buffalo Trace built a single barrel rick house to kind of just have that title. <laughs> well, that's where all the six year was aged and pretty much all of our oldest products. Uh, they still have the very first barrel that they filled up. Um, they were never gonna bottle it or anything. So sometimes when we have special events, Pat and Shane will take some guys out there, just take whoever, let them taste some of it. Um, they joke now that they can hold the barrel above their heads, so I'm sure it's around 170 pounds. It probably doesn't have that much liquor left in it. So for each row, you're gonna have around 114 barrels. We have 30 rows on each floor. So each floor is going to hold around 3,420 barrels, six floors. So the total comes out to around 22,400 or something like that. Um, so most on this floor, I want to say are around three to four years old. Um, and as you can see, it's a completely wooden structure on the inside. Uh, we don't really want to have too much metal in here or anything like that, just because it's going to be reacting with the alcohol a little weirdly. Um, but not too much uh, evaporation or anything going on on this floor. Typically after the three to four year mark, 
these barrels are going to be pretty messy. You're going to see a lot of stuff starting to come out of them. Um, we'll loop around here again. I'll kind of show. Is that little plumb or dangling thing down there lets us know if the rick house is kind of shifting its weight. Um, you've probably heard of some rick houses collapsing and a lot of those barrels <laughs> throwing a loss. Yeah, so it's very rough. So what's going to happen is pretty much if we put too many barrels on this side, that's going to start moving. It's going to just sway one direction and just let us know, hey, the weight's unevenly distributed. Um, so from there, we'll start putting some more barrels on the left side. So we have one here and on that side, and then there's another one about a third of the way down as well. So it just kind of lets us know if anything's moving. So is that square there, kind of the tolerance for the for the plumb? Yes. Okay. So yeah, and sometimes cool. it'll just go out. Luckily, I haven't had to worry too much about it, um, but who knows in the future sure. once these get a little older. I mean, they're mm -hmm. still fairly young. Um, and we're not quite yet like Buffalo Trace, who knows which Rick House is gonna like produce the perfect one during this time, because we don't have that much data to work with, but, in a few years, hopefully we'll get there. Any other questions?